Tom? Um, no, I'm all right on my laptop, like I said. Can you make it a little bit bigger so I don't have to find my glasses? <clears throat> sure. Oh, people with glasses. That's okay. A pain, in which case I can get up my ass. It's all good. No, it's not a big deal. Is Thank there a reason why you don't use space CF? Wait, what? Is there a reason why you don't use space CF? Yes, because that tends to break how my mode line looks. Because zooming apparently is too hard of a problem. Ah, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you could get me there with one of those shortcuts I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it usually works for me, so... How oh, dare you, Justin. You're messing with a fire there, mate. Just, um, you're just going to show just a tiny bit of halogen DSL. So. This is the kind of like syntax we used to write HTML when we did in halogen. Um, and it can be a bit tedious to write. And the same goes for HTML in of itself. And so when I, um, when I was still writing HTML, which I didn't do anymore these days because yeah, I do this thing. But um, if I make an HTML file, I think I might even have that here. So if I do ISD tab, yeah, OK, so it works. OK, so Emacs already has this thing. So if I do like, um, I'd like an unordered list, and below I'd like to have an li. Please give me two of those. And then I then I tab. What it's going to do is it's going to expand this bit of HTML for me. Um, and what I can do here is I can like put classes on these elements, uh, that kind of stuff. And that did not exist for PScript um, yet, and there was no Emmet like. Thing we generated it, and so I figured I'd just write it because it seemed like a nice little problem. And I used arcane technologies, <coughs> recursion schemes, to do it. Not because they're like uh, because it's necessary for this kind of problem, just because I wanted to try it out. So, and that's what Pure Script Emmet is. And so, let's hope that my installation instructions work. I don't think. I haven't on this machine yet because I didn't. I just got a new computer, and so okay. So now I'm just going to get this on the tab. Let's see if that works. Okay, that works. So if I do dot asd, okay, okay. And so, so I've got chat going on here. Ah. Okay, so it's all access. Okay, all right. So. Uh, so I have it on the path now, and what I've done is I've written a tiny bit of elist here, which uh, all it does it, it is it uh, grabs all the text between the current cursor and the beginning of the line, and then it runs the pure script Emmet uh, binary, which is this thing, um, with that text as the standard input. So if I do uh, like this, and I send it a line which is reads like div dot form control. What it's going to do is it's going to give me back the halogen DSL for HTML that you need to produce the correct HTML, basically. And then I found that to a key here, which is e. Okay. And so if I go in here, I'm going to go and say, um, give me a div with the class uh, form control. Uh, well, it should probably start. So. So with the class form control, and then underneath that, please give me uh, a div. Maybe give me a label. Uh, and next to that, give me another div. Uh, maybe give me a good. How about that? Okay. And so if I now go ahead and expand that, what it's going to give me is this piece of allergen DSL, which is a little annoying to type out otherwise. You can see that it uses the underscore thingies, which don't take um, like the second or like the second array, so they don't take any attributes uh, if you don't specify any. Yeah, and I just use this to like speed up and work for a bit when I'm writing some HTML. So.
Um, if anyone's interested, I can go through the implementation some other time. I think it's a bit complex to just wing it right now, which is not warranted for the problem at all. But that sounds all right. You've got some questions in the chat. Oh, I've got questions in the chat. I, yeah, the chat is always gone uh, when you're presenting. Okay, render HTML but it looks a lot like an opportunity for a prepro. Okay, if we're, okay, and so and Joe is going to present to me. Okay, so render HTML builder. Okay, so maybe that's somewhere in here, right? So it's probably in here. Nope. Oh, I know where it is. Now what you're talking about? Okay, HTML builder. Uh, well, I guess. I mean, there's a catamorphism up here. Like, there's a cata up here. Um, so what this thing does, it collapses the, um, but yeah, OK, so, OK. So I know what this thing does. So this actually renders HTML. So if you want, like, my version of Emmet, but there's, like, a way better version of Emmet, of course, which already does HTML, but I, I use this to verify that my thing would work in the first place. And so uh, you can write, like, one of these renderers pretty easily with just like one catamorphism that collapses this like HTML tree that the thing builds. Yeah. Might be like a fun task to maybe do this for the Pux syntax. I don't know how that works at some point. Um, yeah, but because I don't use it, uh, I guess it doesn't really make sense for me to do that. All right. I've got this thing going what we were looking at, whatever it is, uh, the exorcism. What were we going to do with that? I just got the CLI and everything set up. I don't know if we want to go through it or is that the idea? Oh, the exorcism thing? Yeah. Oh, um, I'm not sure. Um, I just. Oh, you got a hat. I didn't recognize you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Please don't yeah. ask. <laughs> I uh, just made a bunch of talking points that oh, uh, cool. we maybe somebody who attends knows a lot, uh, quite a bit about it and can introduce and share about it. Um, most of these things I don't have much knowledge about myself. I, I made this list. <laughs> um, okay. yeah. So this is uh, more of an awareness thing that if you're looking for a place to learn peer script, there's Exorcism. I haven't used exorcism myself, but maybe somebody here has. Not yet, but I just set it up. So I don't know if you want to go through it or someone's used it in, with Rust in the past. Um, yeah. I don't know. How does it work? Is it worth going through or maybe help people get started? Yeah, it's worth spending a few minutes on it, like maybe the first lesson to see how it works. Yeah, well, I've, I can just show what I've done so far. It's not, I literally have just pulled it down and then um, had a, should I share, 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 where am I? Share my screen. Here we go. Right, you can see that, can't we? So I've just basically gone to the repo, downloaded it. Uh, I don't know, pump up the fonts a bit. All right, I can't draw on the screen. <laughs> Slack, best feature, the drawing. Uh, yeah, so I've basically just, I'm on uh, OSX, so I just did it via Brew, somewhere up here. Oh, 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 let me find it, come on. There you go, so I just did Brew update, Brew install exorcism, and that seemed to have done the job. And then you have to exorcism configure, and they give you like a little API key. Uh, which is on the site. Oh my God, look at all these. Uh, here we go. Yeah, so on the little instructions you've got here, where's key? There, your account. And then there you go, just gives you a key. So I think that's how to get it connected. Uh, so I did that. And then I just cloned that repo. Obviously, I already had pure script, so I've got pure script one, whatever. So now I'm in that repo. Uh, 
and I'm not sure how we start. I guess, is it exercise? Oh no, there's an exercise folder. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, so I guess I'm going to have to do like a, from here, um, I'm just like going to the folder. Order? Lesson one, lesson two? I think there is, maybe on, does it give you an order? Do you see? No, I don't think you're supposed to pull the repo down. Oh, you know. Uh, no, no, no. If, um, I'm going to send you a link. Oh, wait, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. But you're okay. supposed to do exorcism fetch pure script. Oh, hello. Exorcism. Okay, we can do that. Right. And, I mean, you already did the configure one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool then. So I don't need to get the repo at all. Okay. Oh, hello. Oh. What's going to happen here? Thanks. Here we go. Oh, problem one. Hello, world. New problem. Oh, so I've got to go into. Okay, so there's hello world in. C... Oh, let's put it somewhere really convenient. Okay, so let's get out of this. Um, so the extra systems CLI will put a folder in your home directory called extra system, and then. Cool. Each language is its own directory in there, and then each exercise is a directory in there. Uh -huh. it, 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 like that, that uh, exercise and client will make the sequence of stuff. exercises for you. Cool. So I can, from within here, then I can just, uh, okay. Um, what is it? X. Uh, pure script. Uh, where am I? Hello. Oh. Someone's got some nice music going on. Ah, someone's jazzing. Hello world. Cool. And then from here I'll just do a bow install, I guess. That'll probably be the first step. I think that's the idea, isn't it? Whilst that's doing that, we can look at the source. Module hello world where? Read me. Hey, there's a read me. Hold on, I'll pump up the old. Pump up the font. And lose it. Oh no, read me. Here we go. So, uh, the classical introduction exercise say hello world. Hello world. Okay, the objectives are simple. Write a function that returns a string hello world. Run the test suite and make sure that it succeeds. Uh, submit your solution and check it at the website. If everything goes well, you'll be ready to fetch your first real exercise. Uh, I will, yeah, so you'd have to run this. I've obviously already got pure script um, here. Um, and pulp. And then bower is what I did. So bower install. I just installed the dependencies. And then we'll do pulp build, which hopefully it's finished. Yep. Pulp build. And I'll build it. So it's going to grab lots of stuff for a hello world. <laughs> so beginner friendly, call you need a flying by. <laughs> beginner friendly, there we go. Maybe for the test though, won't it? And I guess if we do pop test, that should fail right now. Hopefully. Yeah. So cannot import hello world from module hello world. It neither exists. So it's basically saying, so we don't have anything called Hello World in here, do we? Let's pump this up. Cool. Um, let's have a little look at the test on the one. Then. Test. Okay. Um, why are you happy? Here we go. It shouldn't come up before. There we go. I'll just do a little. It should be cool now. And it's still complaining. Function that returns the string hello world. Yeah, I think I'm just... that looks wrong though, right? Because that test does not. Sweet. Hello world dot hello world test hello world no name. Assert equal. Okay, so we're gonna write a function. I'm confused already. Okay. Is that the idea? Uh, sweet. Do test hello with no name. 
a shirt you called Hello World. Hello World, nothing. What? So if you pass Hello World, nothing, it will just return you Hello World. So what are we gonna? Should we do its type or yeah? We'll do its type. Yeah, it's probably the best. Yeah. So what type should we give it? String. Well, um, look at what it's taking in the test. There so though. Maybe. Well, with the. I know. Okay. So it's a maybe string. Maybe it's a string. And then uh, her world, and well, I don't. Know. So it returns as a maybe string. Has it got an input? No, 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 no. It, it, the input is the yeah. is the maybe, right? And it returns a string. Okay. So equal. Oh, are we. Mm. Yeah, it's a function, right? So you, the time's not complete yet. So the maybe string is the first argument and that returns a string. Yeah. Oh, come on. This is unnecessary. Oh, it's definitely, but I'm going to do it anyway. There. Just to make those arrows look all pretty. <laughs> Ooh, Unicode. Boom. <laughs> well, I, I did it with, I did it with these guys as well. <laughs> That's just forceful habit. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So we're going to take a maybe string and return a string. What should we call it? Do. Uh, oh, do we want to type metric? Or oh, sorry, do you want to um, try and think here? Hello world, nothing. Okay, so we want to type match against it, don't we? Yeah, go for a pattern match. Pattern match. Why did I say type match? Um, okay. I need to import these, surely. This isn't going to work at all. Sorry, I'm just trying to start. PSCIDE. Okay, so it's loaded. I'm just cheating. Basically, you can, <clears throat> when you've got PSCID installed, you can import things. So, comma, MI, A should automatically import. I've got maybe already. And that would be from, from where? String. String's just String. in the pre loop. Yes, it's, it's in prim, actually. You don't even, it's not even in the prelude. Just there. I'd, I thought everything used to be in a prelude. Uh, nothing, nothing, and then here it's going to contain saying, string, though. Oh, is it string nothing? Oh, yeah. So the test wants you to return the string hello, comma, world. And oh. like yeah, I'm skipping. I was looking on the right. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, I do this every day. Uh, okay. It is great. I'm learning too. Um, here it should be complaining. Sort of saying, uh, there we go. So you're missing something. That's what it should be saying. Okay, well. And then we'll have a just of, oh, yes. Of underscore, so I guess it's anything. Oh, no, no, we'll give it a value. And then it should return test. Okay, hello, hello, Bob. Okay, so then it should just do hello. Um, is it comma? Yeah. And then we'll give it a. Oh, I forgot to import that. It couldn't. Can you just import prelude? Um. Yeah. I think that's just open with the open import. Um, it's prelude, it's prelude. Got it. Yeah, that should work. Hey. 
Okay. So. Um, Do we need to go back to the exorcism CLI client now? Like exorcism. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so those don't know that's append. So it's kind of like a one of these in JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously it's um, strings only in this situation. Cool. So we're saying, if you look, just going, hello world, nothing. And hello world, if we're giving it just a, so as in here, hello world, just Alice, then we wanted to append them together. And so on. So we'll run that, pulp test. Hopefully you'll go, yeah, I'm not happy. Although to a sample name, oh, what was the other case we didn't spot? Oh, you yeah, exclamation mark, I think. Um, yeah, the exclamation mark at the end is missing. Details. Details. Oh, man. <laughs> Extremely tight <type> programming. <laughs> Fixed it. <laughs> Yeah, strongly type programming is right. Wait, oh, look, you get a little ta da! -da. Right, anyway. <laughs> you got a ta da at the end of that. Is there something we're cool. trying to do in the exorcism client to send this back up? Yeah, okay. So, uh. Oh, uh, oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Which file, path to file? Which file are we submitting? Uh, Maybe the test file? I guess so, yeah. I'd say that's a good bet. Maybe try with no arguments first. <laughs> with what arguments? No arguments? Oh, just bam. Present a file name. <laughs> uh, so what? It's in test, isn't it? System? Where are you going? Vince? Oh, you could just try. Just try. What the help client, like what, what does exorcism submit dash dash help or something? Does it tell you something? Yeah. What I go for. Test, allow submission of test file. Yeah. Oh, no. So it's actually the file then it looks like. Because if you do dash dash test, that'd be. Um... Oh, the source file? Yeah, I'm going to guess that. Let's do it. Programs generally spend far more time reading code than writing. Okay, you have a solution to this problem. Oh, so we can have a little look. Let's see. What does that other great pure scriptors do? Oh, there I am. Look. <laughs> You're famous. Okay, well, we don't want to. Hopefully, lots of people got this right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, oh, I guess they're trying to do the console. Okay. That's fine. That's not. Um, okay, so we've done that. So did it judge it as being correct? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I think it says looks good. Oh, no, wait, never mind. There was a little looks good thumbs up before. I guess it's building. Oh, yeah, it's doing something. Oh, yeah. Must be on a CI, CI system. I mean, it's all like Koya NATO. Better be good. No, <laughs> Okay, so it's doing its thing. Well, we can do like step two, surely. I wonder if you can get points for this. Like, oh, it's got and then one you get coming. badges, and then you can show. Oh my god! I'm gonna... Yes, and then you can like be the pure. Uh, okay. So... The, thing was a bit, the thing was a bit strange that the readme said you just need to return the hello world string, and it ended up like being an actual function that you need to write. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit nondescript. Um, so how do we get the next one then? Oh, let's go well, back some. About value work exercises. Here we go. Okay, cool. They look like they're not alphabetical order, so I assume Literally. If you read, if you read the text at the top, I have to read every this. time. Yeah, just. Oh man, we on so Just execute that fetch command again, and it'll get the next okay. one. Okay, Christoph, who does reading? It's like going getting IKEA and going. I'm going to read that manual. Um, 
Okay, I'll do that. I'll do the sensible thing. One new problem. Hmm? Sorry? Do you, do you think it would make sense for these exercises to like stub out some of the functions with type holes? And then oh. that's what you would get when you download it. Like you'd get <coughs> the function you're supposed to implement and then like, you know, question mark X or whatever. And yeah, that way you can yeah. start working on like, you know what the type sig is for some really basic stuff. Maybe I wouldn't build then. Mm. Well, then build all the way up to the, the main function. function. I don't know. No, my idea. It's a good idea. Oh, it's a I think we should definitely fix that, but. Yeah, so I, was, I guess right now, there's our leap. Yeah, even with like a little something. Um, and then in here, we'll just, okay, there's our test. I'll do that. It's annoying. Wait a second. Wait, wait a second. Do they do all those weird leap year rules? There's weird rules about leap years. Oh, no. It's like every couple hundred it changes or something. <laughs> I don't want to think about leap years. Why no. do this? It's, yeah, it's every fourth is a leap unless, like, unless it's divided by, divides cleanly by 100. And that rule does not work if it divides cleanly by 500 or something. Yeah, Tom wrote it on the chat. Oh, there's a read me. Oh, yeah, read the read. Oh, Vince, why do you not read anything? Oh, there we go. There we go. Look. Given a year, the tricky thing is this leap year is a Gregorian calendar occurs. Gregorians. And every year that is evenly divided by four, except every year that is evenly divided by 100, unless the year is also evenly divided by 400. <sighs> Man, I'm scared already. Okay. Well, it's easier than I thought. I mean, it's just those three rules. I mean, it's better than having to do like system calls into some weird thing. <laughs> okay. This is probably a nice way to show off stuff like guards and like a single function. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what are we calling it? Yeah, I can see the value in an exorcism's discussion feature where you can you have a friend come in and do a code review and then suggest using guards instead of header match, for example. Oh yeah. That's just gonna devolve into point free everywhere though. <laughs> <laughs> you just need a good reviewer. How could we make this with recursion schemes? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, okay, is leap year. So we're gonna pass in a int and get returned an int. I mean, you genuinely could do this with recursion schemes if you recursed over net. And I've got nothing better to do, so I'll be back in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to return a boolean, though. It's uh, yeah. pretty good. It's oh, we're just going to make it true or false. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you can say that it's already equal true. Oh, oh, yes, it is. Sorry. I'm doing that, you know, when you don't read things. <laughs> I'm so good at that. Seems to be your thing. It is definitely, honestly. This is kind of a fun game, the exorcism, doing this with, uh, with friends. <laughs> do this. It'd be, it'd be kind of nice to do this for the PureScript hack things every third Saturday. Oh, yeah. yeah some, well, one some thing we, we should definitely do is well, while we go through it and we find inconsistencies like the one we just found in the first one, we should maybe work on fixing those. It looks like it should be a simple pull request on that GitHub repo. Mm -mm -mm. Well, I'm not sure, entirely sure how simple it is, but yeah. I think they're just all in here, it looks like. Yeah, so they literally, you get readme uh, and then test. So, so I guess it just expects a test to pass. So it would just be a case of adding stuff. Um, what else is written on here? You can contribute. Um, asking for help, how to contribute with port or fixing bugs. Uh, okay. Yeah, just write a pull request. So I guess it's straight into the test. It doesn't look like 
as much else. I guess these dots and stuff are part of the the actual. I know there's other stuff. Oh, okay. Some dots. Oh, you know that thing where? Yeah, I can't read. Okay, let's go. I okay, wonder if we done. should uh, move on to an, another topic. Um, like this is, you know, pretty yeah. great. Uh, unless we have more discussion on this. No, no, no. Okay. Well, cool. What well, else? That's, that's. I mean, cool. I think it's kind of nice to see how this, and I guess kind of know how to how one would move on from here. Kind of like the koans in this way. You need to make unit test screen. I like it. You feel what? Sorry, the. What was your okay. suggestion, Christoph? No, no, no. I just. I just wanted to comment on like the whole exorcism thing being actually a kind of a cool exercise. And I'm kind of motivated to do the Rust one now because I just read that there is a Rust one apparently. There's a what? What one? Rust. Rust. Sorry. Oh, there's a Rust one. Okay. Ah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's not too bad. I'm, I'm not sure of like the installing thing, but cool. Okay. Well, if anyone wants to try that. That's kind of how it goes. Um, yeah, I don't know what you want to chat about, Alex. Um, uh, just want to give fair time to like other items that we might want to uh, discuss here. I didn't have anything specifically I can talk about. Um, I saw that uh, PeerScript News had some good stuff uh, in uh, in their news in the newsletter, so it's, it's worth giving a shout out to the PeerScript News maintainers um i wonder if there's i wonder if that was just paul that's doing that um paul young maybe i'm not sure um but yeah uh, there's a, a show like somebody made a show instance for pure script records which i think is pretty great because that's always a big hang up for people um there's somebody complaining about uh you can like you can't show something in the peer script repl unless there's a show instance for it and it's and that can be kind of frustrating sometimes like you'll get a, an error instead of some feedback for uh, just any anything useful just get an error unless there's a show instance for it. right but yeah anyways uh hmm. let me just share my screen Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't used, uh, this myself yet, but I certainly will next time, uh, I need to inspect records at all. This is a pretty simple <laughs> way of taking, uh, a record type, uh, and then presuming everything else in that record, like all the values, like uh, here at one, and this is a record, which has another showable. These all have show instances, strings and numbers and record and now records. So as long as everything in that record is showable, has a show instance, then you guys pass it the show record and it makes a pretty nice, uh, well, you know, it depends on what the data type is that you want to show, how complex the object is. But this is certainly better than what we had before, which is perhaps just an error message. Uh, someone's mic is leaking. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if anybody else has anything else to say about that. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Joe's going to do like demos and stuff. Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple things if we're still looking for other random demo stuff. But like one really short one, and then one real world pure script that actually got used a couple weeks ago in production. Um, let's see. All right. You guys all see that? Yeah. So Justin's been kind of bullying me into doing some how PureScript can run on Lambda stuff for the past couple of days. And so I finally did it one night. Um, so yeah, actually, it wasn't super bad. I thought that this was going to involve a little more FFI and things like that. But it turns out that it's not terrible to get PureScript to run on Amazon Lambda. Um, just using the data.function.uncurried library. 
and uh, other normal stuff to get stuff in and out of JSON, so like simple JSON, which has been kind of awesome. So uh, for anyone not terribly familiar with Amazon Lambda, it's basically a service Amazon offers where you can just run a JavaScript function in response to some kind of input. So you get sort of a um, function where you know it's got like a, an event and some context that's just a big JSON record and then you give it a callback where the first argument is an error and then the second is a success value and then you do something with that. Um, and it turns out that that can be modeled in PureScript not too badly We're using some of this stuff here, so like run FN2. Um, so hold a second. Well, let me just show it off. I think that might be a little bit better. Um, there's some kind of magic here to get this callable from JavaScript a little easier. So I've got a little weird webpack thing here where I build it. I spit it out into an index.js file, and then I echo on exports ps.handler because there's a bug in pulp right now that won't work with Browserify with non-main modules. But the end result is that if I bundle all of this stuff up, it's going to take a little bit. And I run node. I can import this handler function that's all written in pure script, which in this case just reads in a record and then tries to decode this record format. And then when I call it, it tries to decode that record and then throws an error if it's false. So you can see here, it's looking for a message string and it got a message number. And so it's got Justin's sort of simple JSON helpful error property payload, error property message, type mismatch string number. And if I call that function again, but with the appropriate stuff, it works. And it just echoes that back out because that's all this little thing is doing. Um, and what you can do here is I can copy the payload and then paste it into the Amazon Lambda kind of interface and save it. And then I've got a test that fails here. When I run it, the lambda function's failed and it's returned a nice little stack trace showing what my error was. And if I do test pass and do that again, it just works. Um, Is there a CLI way of taking a, a node project and pushing it up to AWS? Um, they have a kind of thing. So I'm actually pretty bad at automating some of my projects and stuff like that. I think that there is something that Amazon lets you do. Like all of these serverless frameworks do that. And Amazon says that there's a way that you can make it upload to an S3 bucket and then copy in from there. Um, so you could definitely make it part of the CLI workflow. I've just sort of been copying stuff into it or uploading zip files and things like that when it passes local tests. Um, the really neat thing, I mean, the main reason that I kind of wanted to do this is because this isn't super motivating as an example. Like this is just a simple callback. So. There's not a whole lot of fancy stuff going on here, but the thing I really wanted to do is I wanted to use F to deal with all of my async stuff when I was writing Lambda things. Um, so Well, this function that you just wrote, is, is that running like kind of in the public now? Um, well, it's running on Lambda and, yeah. sorry, uh, what was that? Is this publicly accessible at some IP address and you can pass it a payload? Uh, well, no, so the way Lambda kind of works is you can configure little hooks that call these functions, so it's not publicly accessible, but it's accessible using like this ARN here. So if I have something else running on Amazon uh, that works with Lambda, so you can sort of see how you can hook different things up here, I can trigger it, and then in that uh, event payload that it gets, the first bit of JSON that I'm deserializing, it passes that into the function. So this is just sort of a way that you can take any random bits of data from these things like CloudWatch and S3 and Kinesis or all of this stuff, you know, Alexa, and then pass it in there. Hmm? Just like a gen like an API HTTP request? Um, I mean, really uh, anything. So it's like you could, I don't know, you could get HTTP requests to come in through something like API Gateway, but this is really like, say you've got, um, so like AWS IoT gives you like a PubSub broker 
And so say you've got some messages coming in there, you can write a thing that looks for a specific type of message. So like say maybe a message that's got um, a field called lights and a, it's like a Boolean true or false. And whenever the lights are off, it fires off a payload to Lambda and then the handler can act on it and then maybe call an HTTP endpoint or call some other Amazon service. It's just a way of writing like little glue logic. But it's all written in JavaScript and I kind of wanted to make that a little safer and a little easier on me to deal with. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of interested in the, the AWS's Lambda, like what that feels like. I've looked at yeah. the Google, Google Web Platform. They have uh, uh, some, like a Lambda thing too. I think it's just called functions <laughs> and they only like yeah it's but i think it's mostly for http requests and then you can send certain events from other uh, google cloud platforms services like the, like the storage buckets or uh, logs or something into that function like yeah so it's pretty similar not, yeah not so exactly. mm -hmm. sorry it's yeah it's not exactly the same though so yeah i'll let you yeah thanks for discussing that i'll let you carry on with your more motivating well, example so uh, one of the things when you were talking about sort of like the storage stuff, you can actually make it so that it watches like an S3 bucket. And when a new file comes in, the event payload will have like some kind of metadata for that file. And then you can write a Lambda thing that works on the file that you upload to an S3 bucket. So you can have sort of, you can think of all of these bits of glue logic that would normally have to be in a server you'd write. You could just have running here on this kind of compute ether in Amazon servers somewhere, just doing things you tell it to. Um, and yeah, and the only other thing I sort of have for the simple part of this is just um, adding stuff with F is really easy, which is just the, the nicest thing about this. Like I write a function in F and it does some asynchronous stuff. So like I'm using the, I'm using Milkis um, to do a wrapper around node fetch. So I'm just fetching the IP address of this thing. Um, and then I'm reading the JSON value out of it. And then I'm decoding the results. So this is kind of neat. This run f turns an asynchronous f into a synchronous f. Um, it just runs it and then attaches this callback to it. And so I can say if I could go to this address and get this IP address and decode everything properly, then run the callback handler that I've specified to handle my successful Lambda stuff with the successful message. And if I haven't, then throw an error. And this just makes it do a stack trace so that it's something that Lambda expects to see. And otherwise, the code is basically all exactly the same as the other one. I've got to use FFN3 instead of FN3. Um, and if you're not familiar, FN1, 2, and 3, and FFN1, 2, and 3, these are just ways of going from the curried normal function application that PureScript has to sort of an uncurried representation that JavaScript can consume without any kind of FFI. Um, so I don't have to write like a little um, separate FFI module to interface with the JavaScript. I can just write this on pure script and then this library takes care of uncurring things so that normal JavaScript programs can use it. Um, so for this one, I bundle it up and then I go into the REPL. There's totally better ways to do this. Oh, right, if I actually install all my dependencies and then bundle it up and go to the REPL, it's very important. What? Okay, we need to have the right dependencies. Also very important when you're calling stuff from Node. I love how every NPM message is like one page of garbage, so every time you need to scroll back up. Yeah. Inside to give you to tell you where they wrote that super annoying debug log file, which no one ever wants. Yeah, I all I just got to clean up scripts and things to get rid of stuff like that. And I love how Webpack gives me a bunch of error messages. And I'm just like, it's just a warning. I'll ignore it. It'll be okay. Um, so same deal. I just import the handler, and then in this case, uh, my payload is just going to be nothing because I'm not using it. My context is going to be nothing because it's not useful. And then I'll just log the error if it exists. Otherwise, I'll log the result. And then you can see here, it is asynchronous, so it like returned immediately. And then afterwards, the callback called the value of the IP address. And since 
I'm probably unsafe stringifying something in here somewhere. It's not happy about the result being a record in a write value thing like that. But that's not a problem for real functions, like where we're going to actually use stuff. This is just sort of a demo thing. But yeah, so it's asynchronous pure script being called from JavaScript, which is just especially nice because AF is awesome for dealing with all this asynchrony and it's way better than dealing with promises. Um, but the, the reason that I originally got into all this in the first place is I had to do a little thing where um, my company was putting uh, like a little kind of small enclosed meeting space out at Amazon reInvent this year and they wanted us to make a little Alexa skill where you could ask it questions about the company and get fun facts about things like that. Um, and I kind of thought that would be a neat way to do it in pure script because I had a little extra time and uh, I thought I could do that. So the main kind of takeaway here is that for me, you could do a whole bunch of neat little asynchronous pure script stuff um, on Amazon Lambda, which is not designed to work with pure script or functional program. It's really just designed to work with JavaScript and it's all not that terrible. The whole thing ended up taking a couple days and uh, was a lot less difficult to work with when I got things up and running than the original JavaScript SDK. So I can kind of bundle everything up like I did before, maybe? Well, I can run a test. All right, npm not node. <clears throat> And so this is normally what like Alexa gives you as a response. Um, so it's run the pure script and it's picked a random thing out of a set of different responses I can give. And it, normally if you ask this from like a little echo dot or something, it would actually speak this out to you. So some of the code's kind of opaque. Um, it ended up being a lot of FFI, but the neat thing was like, I needed to call on this JavaScript library to do geometric kind of decoding, turf.js. And it was all just a really simple FFI, and then it just kind of worked correctly the first time, as soon as I got all the FFI stuff not working, which was pretty sweet. That's really cool. Yeah, so the, the main thing that these end up doing, and kind of going to the handler, is um, there are these Alexa functions that call this Amazon SDK, and it can do things like register callback functions using this really weird JavaScript, like you have to pass it a record of functions and then it adds it onto this weird state machine that Alexa's got internally to do all this kind of stuff. I don't really understand how it works very well, um, but I understood it just enough to kind of hack together some weird FFI stuff. Um, this is actually all on a public GitHub somewhere. I took Justin's naming scheme and called it like god awful Alexa test or something like that. But the neat thing is you get this kind of monadic way of building a handler up with a bunch of different things like this handler is going to speak this thing and respond with this other thing. Or uh, sorry, this handler is gonna speak this thing and then respond just closes the action that registers all the handlers. Um, but for the function for finding a building, it's this whole big thing where it takes your response in this thing called the slot, it reads out the words that you've said and then it tries to actually reverse geocode using all that turf JS stuff and using some fetch API stuff uh, from Google's geocoding API to get your lat long and then return to you the closest feature in that list of in a list of like JavaScript or uh, turf JS GeoJSON features. And like I think the whole thing really once I figured out how all the GeoJSON stuff worked out, it, it only took like a day or two or three maybe to get all of these things sorted out in my spare time. Um, so it was a really pleasant experience. So you, the idea is you can ask Alexa, uh, hey Alexa, where's like, well, how many how many WeWorks are there in a certain city? Yeah, so the, this was super simple. It wasn't that long request and check a database. Well, so this is actually kind of the neat thing. It's not actually checking a database. Um, I loaded up this big thing of GeoJSON which tells you how near all of these locations are to like when you're asking something. So like it's got a lot long coordinate system and then a city tag of what city it's in and the name of the actual building. And so when you say, you would say basically like Alexa, uh, ask WeWork to find a location near, you know, we'll say maybe Pasadena and it'll go and it'll reverse, it'll find out where Pasadena is. It'll grab out Pasadena from your phrase um, and then pass that to the reverse geocoding API. The reverse geocoding API will find you a lot long for the city it thinks you're asking it for 
And then that lat long will um, get fed into a function provided by turf here uh, called nearest, where you pass in a feature, which up here, a feature is just a string map of some properties, which tells you the city name or where it is. And this geometry, which is just a set of coordinates, which are just uh, an array of like numbers, it's Latin long. Um, and then nearest returns you the nearest place in this feature collection that is closest to the feature you sent it. So you say a city name, it goes out to Google, it gets a lat long and then generates a feature for turf. And then it finds the closest feature in that feature collection. And then this is wrapped in a whole bunch of multiple errors because it's going out and getting random JSON from JavaScript so it could fail at any time for any reason. So we're basically just saying, hope that it all works and then if it fails with some error, then I'll send a helpful error message and then log something to the back end. But yeah, we had this out uh, at the show floor at AWS reInvent in the little phone booth that we had out there and it got used by like a couple hundred people. Um, and I don't think it failed for any reason. So go pure script. Wow. There's some requests from the chat to uh, release this as a uh, pure script Alexa library. So um, I was thinking about doing something like that. I, the thing that, so I don't really, I'm not really happy with any of the things that I ended up doing to get this to work. It all works, but it all works in really terrible ways. And it's very shameful that any of these things are done the way they are. Like, um, it really is just, it's one step better than stringly type nonsense, but it is a little bit better. So like, really what you end up doing is you get like a this from JavaScript, like literally the this object and you pass it around because Alexa registers things by calling this dot and then using some of the built-in um, methods that the Alexa handler comes with. So I'd really like to find a better way to guarantee that, you know, maybe say if you got a record of all of the things you want to say to it, that you can get a type check thing saying you forgot to add a handler for this type of intent that you want to execute on. Um, and actually what Justin was doing with some of the uh, stuff he did with uh, his little bid tracker project where it does that with your get and post handlers is something I wanted to check out. You make like a type class and you use some fancy row list magic and then it'll tell you if you've written out a type of all of the things to attach handlers to or if you didn't do it successfully. Um, but the basis for what this is is actually up on my GitHub somewhere. Um, the picture uh, is courtesy. <laughs> This is uh, that's Justin. He's the memes. The memes are too good. good. <laughs> He's convinced me that Rollist is the future, so I decided to really lean into that. Um, yeah, so I've got this thing, and it's really terrible, and the name is self-explanatory. Um, but it kind of works. So if you ever end up doing anything with Alexa and you want to do something with PureScript, reach out to me, and I can send you maybe some code that's maybe a little more advanced than this, and I can push some of the stuff I did here into it. Um, but yeah, it's pure script running Amazon Alexa functions and a whole bunch of terrible FFI on AWS Lambda all through JavaScript and it all actually kind of works out okay. And the pure script, uh, pursuits, I think should also have, uh, Alexa voice input where you can get Alexa to answer your questions for you or PS pure script functions. <laughs> like Alexa ask pursuit about map and then it finds you a function that's totally not map and then it's like <laughs> <laughs> Did you mean unsafe course? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pure script find map and then all you get is unsafe course for everything. It's a really easy one to write. <laughs> no, we had yeah, we had a little discussion in the chat. I volunteered for Traverse because it's basically the answer to every question you might ask. <laughs> Oh, actually, while I still have this up, um, this is kind of a mundane thing in relation to everything else, but I just want to say being able to do this, like being able to make a type alias that shows my record structure and has all of these types laid out everywhere and pass it in to like, uh, where is this? Where am I using this thing? Yeah, being able to just pass it in here to a read JSON and it like figures out it just gives me this back. This is this is like magic. This is pretty close to magic, and this is this makes me very happy. Like uh, the rest of the Alexa stuff I, is okay, and it's kind of cool. But the fact that I can safely read string nonsense into a data structure and then 
get out a like use this nice map syntax to like map into an array where a thing may have a head or not and then do all of that in a safe manner and it's all very nice is just a breath of fresh air compared to some of the stuff I've had to do to do something similar in any other language. So like the being able to call it the FFI and use PureScript and Lambda is nice, but this is why people should use PureScript. Like these couple lines. I've got a question for the, the people attending. Uh, I, I saw, that, uh, Joe, that you used uh, uncurried or an uncurried way to interact with the Lambda functions, right? Yeah. What's up with that? Uh, I, saw somebody, I saw somebody whispering in chat that they were working on making an uncurried output from the PHP compiler. And I'm, I'm curious if that's like a real thing and how far that could be taken. Because my guess is if everything's going to be uncurried coming out of a PHP compiler, then that would affect uh, a, lot, a lot of different things, maybe like tree shaking or uh, calling functions. Um, yeah, like I wonder if you can only uh, uncurry. Has, has anyone else ever heard of this? Maybe not. I'll have to, I'll have to check. I'll have to check a little further. Well, there was there was there was something about it a, a while ago. I remember, um, mm -hmm. but I think it, it didn't take priority. I think that's what happened. Um, it is it is set to be. Well, I saw someone in the chat say that they had it mostly working. Um, oh, I'm not sure. Oh, really? Yeah. That's kind of neat. Yeah, I mean, for the purposes of the little FFI stuff I have, um, it, like sometimes it's hard to wrap my head around, I guess, when I'm starting out. But these, like, make FFN3 function that basically turns, so, like, I've got handler, impl handler implementation here. That's a normal function. And then the handler just turns that from, like, a three argument F function into a normal, like, uncurry three argument JavaScript function. Um, and it's pretty powerful because, like, you can see here, the three argument f function is actually a two argument function and like a two argument callback function that gets run, like that gets turned into a curried pure script function with run fn2. So like this is some, I think, relatively non-trivial stuff in terms of making FFI interface comfortable. And the JavaScript interface looks like you'd expect a JavaScript interface too. And after a little bit of hand wringing and using these functions here, you basically get a pure script function out. But I can't do anything with that, but um, actually. Yeah, and so you get like a little JavaScript function out here saying what it is. So it's not too bad. The uncurried stuff would maybe be kind of neat for FFI interfacing, but I'm actually pretty happy with the way things have turned out here. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be fancy, you don't even need that little case statement. You can use a... Mm. Yeah, you can use fancy bifunctors. But yeah, that's pretty much all I've got. Um, if anyone wants any kind of clarification or like wants to see more of this or thinks that there's other cool stuff that could be like talked about or written up on this thing, hit me up in the PureScript chat room or DM me in the FP chat Slack because I can share more of it there. I just don't know what I can or can't share from this like actually up in a GitHub repo yet. I don't think there's anything like proprietary in here at all or anything. So I'll probably try and clean it up and put it up on GitHub. Very cool. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, glad you guys liked it. Mm -hmm. Was that the only one that you had, or did uh, um, perhaps you said you had two? Just um, I just... I did have something else, and this has kind of been a longer thing that well, so I there's been this whole like validation thing that people were going on about in the chat this past week or two that started with Steve Syrek wanting to use PureScript for validation at work. And then people just started doing a bunch of validation stuff. Um, but I mean, is everyone here or are people here familiar with the PureScript validation library aside from, I guess, Bill who probably wrote parts of it or most of it. Or like uh, the one that accumulates the errors in the semi group. Yeah, like the, the whole concept of the validation library, like that was, I don't know if I'm still like uh, in the honeymoon phase of this whole library thing, but the fact that you've got an awesome motivating factor for a 
structure that is a semi-group and not a monad or a semi-group and not a uh, monoid and an applicative and not a monad is like super cool and it's really useful and it kind of shows the scenario where having less power is a really good thing because you can use to accumulate all your errors. Um, but I've been just trying to write up some bigger examples on using that and they've got those up in a GitHub repository. Everyone wants to take a look at that too. Um, but the pure script semi group or the pure script validation library is kind of awesome because it's the only time I've seen um, a semi group validation and a semi ring validation where the semi group is for validating over your product types and the semi ring is for using alternative to attempt to validate some types too, which was just like mind blowing the first time I thought of that. Um, and so I've been trying to just write up a couple more examples of that because it's really cool and I want to see more people use it. But it's sort of hard to explain if you don't already know some of the underlying concepts. Yeah, I've never actually seen the summary one. Um, sure, I actually have that up in another repo. I can pull that one up. Uh, let me share my screen again. Let's see here. Go over to GitHub. So uh, this was originally a demo that was just like taking some JavaScript validation that used regular expressions for everything. So this is like a sin, but it's okay for a demo, I think. Um, and everything here is fully qualified because I saw Taylor Fausek do fully qualified stuff on one of his projects, and I thought it was actually kind of neat if you're trying to illustrate where all of your functions are coming from, just having fully qualified inputs for literally everything except alt, because I hate writing fully qualified infix operators. Um, but this is a terrible regular expression for saying that you're going to parse an email. And this is an even more terrible one. And I just copied from Stack Overflow for phone addresses or for phone numbers. So let's just ignore those. Um, but the cool thing about, so if you're, if you're not really familiar with the semi-group validation stuff, I think the idea is pretty much you can define these individual validating functions where you can pass it something to be validated and then you get out of data structure V, the errors that it may have encountered during validation, which is going to be some accumulating structure around the validation error type. So in this case, I've made a little some type called validation error that are all the things that can go wrong. And I've derived some stuff to make it helpful. So I've got like um, generic to be able to get like generic eek and generic show. And then for the semi-ring example, this is kind of neat. Um, for semi-group, it's going to be like any kind of semi-groups, like a non-empty list or an array, where when you're accumulating the errors, you just append the errors together. For the semi-ring, you use the free semi-ring. Um, and I guess that's because kind of, I guess a list is kind of like a free monoid, um, and this is like a free semi-ring, and it's just called that, and I'm probably going to be not saying that correctly, but I think that Tom will be able to give the correct answer, because he knows more about that than I do. Um, but like, so I've got this little function that validates that a string is not empty and it's just a simple little guard that applies string null. And if the string is, is empty, then it returns an invalid result in the free semi ring that says it's an empty field. And it's the same thing for the other ones, like apply the regular expression. And if it passes, then just pass the email through and you get a string out. Otherwise you throw an invalid email address, no special character, less than min length and invalid phone number. Um, and so this is actually kind of nice because you get to declare what all of your different valid or invalid states are and then the results of an invalid state in normal functions. Um, and um, so I kind of wanted to try out with this making the validation errors that you can encounter separate from an error of like what was bad in your form. So if we say that we've got like this uh, form down here, an unvalidated form that's going to be a contact that's a string and a password that's a string, we're basically saying this is our garbage data that could be anything, and then this is our validated output, which is going to be a contact is a new type of a contact, or a new type of a string called contact, or sorry, a some type that's either an email, which is a string, or a phone number, which is a string. Um, and so we basically say you take an unvalidated form, you pass through all your validating functions, and you get out a validated form. But the functions that fail val or the functions that throw errors during validation are going to be separate from the concept of what fields of your form have failed validation. So we've got this useful little form error F, which is either going to be a bad contact or a bad password. And this was originally a concrete function, which is just form error F 
of validation errors, but I wanted to map into it to do some other things later. So this is also kind of another useful example of how you can do useful things by deriving a functor and now you get mapped for all of this stuff. Um, but this is basically a similar thing as before. Form errors is just a free semi-ring of a form error structure that specialized to validation errors. So we're basically saying that we're gonna do two different types of accumulating validation here. Um, we're going to, so say for an email, we wanna validate an email, it's gonna pass it in a string, and you're going to get a validation structure that's gonna have validation errors and a contact. And so we're saying that the constraints for a valid email are that it's non-empty and that it passes the email regular expression. And if it does those things, we're gonna use map to wrap the string that we get as a result in the contact, or in the uh, email data constructor for the contact type. And for phone number, we'll say the same thing. So now we have a, a data structure, or now we have functions that will take a string and give you out some contact if it's correct. And I think that this is the really neat part of it. So we have these two functions, and they take a string and they give us a contact or a validation error in this validation structure V. And the validations library basically lets us take a string, we're gonna call it contact, and then run the validate email function against contact, and if it fails, run the validate phone number function against the contact. Um, and what this does is you can basically say, give me this thing that I don't know if it's valid or not, and give me a some type of potential valid things that it could be, and then give me functions that turn this thing into one of those two fields of the sum type. And if it works, then I'll just give you a result, which is a contact. And if it fails, then in this case, I'm annotating it with bad contact, but give me a bunch of errors. So I've got validation errors from these functions here, and if it fails, then I annotate that using bifunctor with bad contact, so I turn a validation error into a form error. Um, and the way that this all works out in practice, which I think is kind of neat, is I can take a whole form here, which is gonna be a contact and a password, or password is just the same thing for contact with the new type, so it's a little simpler. Um, and also, so for the password, I've got validate now empty, validate password regular expression, validate password min length. And in this case, I'm by mapping um, so that if it fails, it's a bad password, and if it succeeds, we're gonna wrap it in the password data constructor. Um, and so a form validation is taking a record of an unvalidated form, which has a contact and a password, and then producing a new validated form that is a contact where the first field is gonna receive the result of this validation, which is a free semi-ring of form error, which turns it into form errors, um, and then the result of the validated contact, which is gonna be either an email or a phone number. And then it'll do the next validation of the record here, which is password, where it'll do the same thing again, it'll wrap the, um, failing result, form error, in a, for, in a free semi-ring which gives you form errors, and then it results in the validated con, uh, password. And so this function here basically lets you feed in a form and f check each of the fields against these validating functions that you've built up from, like these validating functions are pretty complex, and so what they represent is something complex, but it's all built up from really simple primitives. Um, and so we've got all of these test forms here, and when you run them, um, so this form is like, this top form is like totally empty. And so when you run it, you actually get invalid, bad contact, the field is empty, it has an invalid email address, it has an invalid phone number. So it's saying it failed both the email and phone number validations. Um, and it has a bad password for all the same reasons. Um, and in test form two, it's got a bad email. And so it's saying, nope, still no email, still no phone number, and the password fails because it's not a special character. And so you can basically um, get a really nice way of building up complex logic from very simple logic blocks, and all of the information about how it failed is contained in this validation data structure. Um, and so, you know, when you're actually trying to validate a form, you could just give somebody all of these little functions and say, build up complex form validation logic by stringing them together with this applicative operator. Um, are there any questions about this? This is a kind of a lot. The, the useful part, I think, really, that differentiates it from just semi-group is the fact that semi-ring lets you accumulate, um, I think, the validation library, here we go. 
So the semi ring, the thing that semi ring gives you, I right, here we go. Semi ring gives you a different way to add errors together. So the alternative instance uses semi ring to add two errors together. So it's a different kind of add where you add errors together with the semi group using append. When you have um, alternative here, so with apply, you're using the semi ring to multiply errors together. Maybe I don't understand this as well as I thought I did. Um, so yeah, you're using semi ring to multiply errors together and you're using semi ring to add errors together here for alt. But you've got two different ways of adding errors together, which means you can add errors together in both the product and the sum forms of your form validation, if that makes sense. Do anyone have any like specific questions about it or really get the chat up here? Yeah, I was, I'm still trying to figure out um, exactly what it means to have a validation structure be a semi ring. Um, that's on like, like semi ring, the like, canonical example for me is like numbers, like the natural numbers. Um, you can kind of add them and multiply them and kind of go backwards by a subtraction. That's semi ring, I, I believe. Um, yeah. I know how to map that same idea onto a validation structure like this. Um, well, I, think the, hmm. I think the idea is that semi-ring just gives you two different forms of accumulation, multiplication and addition. Um, and that lets you, this is something that I guarantee someone else in the chat will be able to explain to you better than me. So I would actually definitely yield the floor to them to try and explain the way that this is working properly. I just found out that um, it's actually quite pleasant to use, even if you don't understand exactly how the accumulation is going on. My rough understanding is semi ring being addition um, and or alternative adding up with addition and uh, apply adding up with multiplication. I mean, you basically get to sort of distribute how the errors are supplied over there and collected. Like um, down mm -hmm. here, I'm actually nubbing the array. Because if you don't remove duplicates, if like you have an invalid form with a bad email address and a bad phone number, you'll also get a repeated empty field because it's saying it's empty field for both. Um, but yeah, someone will definitely be able to explain that better than I can, I think. So the semi ring structure compared to the semi group, like semi ring is basically when you take when you have two different semi groups for the same set, and you smush them together and they distribute across one another. And so, um, I guess one of them is the one which always keeps the first error, and the other one might be the one that has them together, or collects them. The way I was thinking about it when I wrote this was, um, I think, sorry, um, the way I was thinking about it was that, uh, you know, you have two, two types of failures you want to track. One is that uh, you could have, um, you know, if you have, a, if you have a record type, right, you could have multiple fields failing independently, in which case, um, you know, I want to keep all the errors, right? But um, like for all the different fields, the other one is I have one field, but I want to validate it in two different ways. And in that case, I also want to keep, you know, um, both, of the, both of the errors, but they don't mean the same thing, but they, they sort of distribute over each other, right? So if you, um, if you just have these two generic operations, meet one meaning sort of like, you know, one field failed in multiple ways and another one meaning two fields failed independently, then you know I can interpret it in different ways by picking a different semi-ring. So if I pick the free semi-ring, that's, uh, free, yeah, sorry, if I pick the free semi-ring, that basically means I'm giving you a type of errors, but I'm, I'm sort of delaying the, the choice of how to combine, how to you know, interpret these two operations until later on. So I just end up with this data structure that tells me the ways the failures got combined um, but I don't attach any semantics to actually combining them. Um, but some other like more concrete things might be something like, um, you know, the max plus semi ring would be maybe a good one. Cause like then your, uh, you know, your addition, um, is, is max and your multiplication is integer plus. Right. So then you could think about that as like maybe, uh, so it's actually called tropical. But I don't know if I uploaded it to pursue. Um, uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, so then the idea could be that um, you, you're just sort of measuring like, you know, a numeric measure of like badness of the, 
of the data, right? And then like when two things, uh, when two fields fail, um, you know, independently, then I'm going to use, uh, what is it? I guess that's regular addition. So that would be uh, max, right? So it fails with like the maximum badness of both of the fields. And if a, fail, if a field fails, you know, in two separate ways, then I add the two measures of badness, right? So you could, you know, you could think about like password validation or something. It could be like, uh, you get one point of, uh, you get one point for like a missing symbol, one point for a missing number. Some some points for like the length or something, and then I can use a semirine to sort of combine them all together. Yeah. Um, but there's lots of different semirines you can pick. So um, I I don't know about integers with multiplication and addition. I haven't really thought about that too much, but I expect there's probably some way of, like uh, interpreting that as well as like counts or something. That's really cool. Yeah, I'd never heard of this. Was there a reason? Well, the tropical centering? Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, it comes from this thing called tropical geometry, which is kind of uh, kind of crazy, but um, yeah, it's kind of useful for a bunch of different applications as well. No, that sounds really useful because, like, like exactly like you said, you can basically define an encoding for how bad the different areas of failure are, and and just kind of get that out when you run this thing. That's really great. So my other favorite use of this thing is. Uh, if you're familiar with like the probability monad, right? Um, so you have like all these different events that could occur with the probability in a list. Um, but if you look at like the definition of the monad, really you don't you don't really use like the, the structure of the probabilities. You basically just assume that the probabilities are um, uh, like a centering, right? So if you if you take the regular real numbers with the usual centering, you get the probability monad. If you take the complex numbers, you get like this quantum programming monad. And if you take this centering, you get uh, what essentially makes like a priority queue monad, which is kind of interesting. So you can sort of like monadically combine all your to-do lists, and every time you have like the same thing appear in the list multiple times, you take the maximum priority for that item. If that makes sense. But if you have two two to-do list items that depend on each other, then you add their priorities up. That's really cool. That's really cool. The probability monad thing is really cool too. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you for going through that. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it really needed. Um, it's sort of funny. It's like twenty lines of uh, you know source, and then the examples are like <laughs> much longer, right? Because uh, it's also like domain logic. But um, yeah, thank you for going through it. it really needed. Uh, right. Yeah. We'll try and merge it into the, the repo or something, hopefully. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually slimming down some of the stuff. I didn't want to bring in like regular expressions and all those other things. So it's actually like, this is what it's ending up as. And it's, I think, much better documented. Um, so I'm going to do one for semi-ring afterwards and get that pulled in too. Or like get that PR, because right now it's just a semi-group one. But yeah, I, I really, really like this, uh, this whole format of validating input. Like this has been exceedingly pleasant. Um, just overall, really, really nice. Feels a little similar to parsing. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I just thought it feels a little similar to how parsec feels when you when you've only done like non puzzle combinators before, where you like have these really small bits and you combine them together, like with this kind of DSL to build super complex things. Yes. Without any like you going in there and manually adding special case or anything, but because it's like all handled in the instances. Yeah, that's exactly the same kind of feeling I got to actually when I was going through this the first time, because like the alternative is just, you know, a bunch of if else, I guess in a lot of cases, if you're using like a JavaScript or something, a bunch of if else to check different things. And there's some other libraries that use objects to chain together stuff like this, but this is, and you know, I'm biased because I'm using this language and I'm here on this meetup talking about all this stuff. But I think that this was, Definitely the most pleasant type of form validation thing I've ever used, which is probably not saying too much because I don't think anyone ever has fun validating forms, but um, it was just, like I said, this very overall nice experience. Um, and you can even do some cute things with like the left functor, or, uh, I don't know what it's called, left caret dollar, um, where you can actually remove some of the stuff where you map other things onto it. But yeah. 
Any other questions? This is all about. Just made me think saying about regex is that uh, Christoph that um, regex is also from a, a semiring, right? So you, you could actually like run. I wonder if you could sort of uh, have your errors be regexes and then you could sort of run them backwards. So if you had like a form that was bad, you could get errors, but also like generate good data as like an example or something. That'd be good. <laughs> anyway, just a random thought. Sorry. Yeah, that's cool too. Uh, yeah, I don't, if no one's got any other questions, then I think that's actually all that I have for real this time. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Joe. Yeah, no problem. I'm glad that other people find this useful. This was just because um, I wanted to see if there was a good way to make some motivating examples for using PureScript for common stuff. And this was really good. Actually, um, one of the things that Justin's kind of been going on about that I've been meaning to play around with but haven't yet is, these are all some types, which is fine in pure script land, but um, the JavaScript representations aren't great. Like when I do unsafe stringify down here, when I do unsafe stringify, but I've got a semi ring, you see all these like value zeros around there because that's JavaScript runtime representation of these some types. But uh, variant has a record representation, so you can actually get like a nice JavaScript representation if you wanted to pass that back out to JavaScript functions. So you could run these validators then. If it fails, you could get like a nice error saying the type that failed and all of that kind of stuff. So I think that would be kind of a neat next step if you wanted to, like if, I, if people wanted to make scenarios where these were useful outside of pure, pure script programming, you could write these type of validators, but then use instead of a some type of variant and then some maybe glue that converts or that exposes that to JavaScript, then you can call these validators from JavaScript. Justin got, just got nerd stabbed, I think. What just that? I think you no, just I mean, snapped Justin. I uh, I worked on a demo over the last couple of days that does this. So yeah, show off business. And then I run it through Flow. So a user just calls PureScript from JavaScript, and it comes back as a variant. And so it's like a normal JavaScript object. I could uh, show it off afterwards. Yeah, that is an excellent segue. Oh, all right. Uh, should I share my screen? I'm not entirely sure if this will work. Let's see. Does this does this work? Yes. Oh, cool. I three. What is this? Uh, yeah. Dogs <laughs> mode ads. No, it's too much. Uh, too much setup. <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, this is a uh, pure script business that I've been working on, right? So it's it's uh. It's actually, it's an accidental name. So Stephen uh, suggested that we should call it this much. And it turns out to be a anti diarrheal So it like controls flows, if, if that's, uh, if that's a clean enough joke. <laughs> but uh, yeah, basically, like it's like the OES library that I've worked on, where I uh, make TypeScript types, and I generate the flow types instead. And, uh, I mean, like the implementation is basically the same. It's just like, okay, for a given type that I'm working with, like, does this type actually have a flow representation that I can use? And so, like, a number is number, string is string, boolean is boolean, and like, you know, like, nullable you can do, array you can do, f is just a thunk function, and then like, you can even like type functions directly, right? Because like, it's a function constructor and it has a and b, so it's like, why not? And then um, the fun thing is that like row records work just fine with rows, and we can uh, use variant, right? So Nate changed this back in September or so, where he changed the variant to actually use an internal record uh, implement, uh, record um, representation. So since it just works as record, then I can uh, generate the types as like type and then the uh, reflect the symbol for the key and then value and the actual value that's inside. So the value type that's inside. And so, yeah, like you can convert sums into variant or just work with variant directly to make it work with JavaScript. So if we look at like our uh, TLDR, it's like this big uh, record, it converts over 
And most importantly, this variant with like A string, B number, or C boolean converts into type A, string literal A value string. And it's like, if you're not familiar with flow, it's like you don't have actual some types in flow or TypeScript, but you do get like union types. And if you have a static discriminant field in your union type, then you can use that to type guard and figure out which branch you're working with. So if we go over to my demo, uh, let's see, add this flow lib, um, the source. So let me look at the source first. So I have like a, some basic like validated stuff and it's like, uh, yeah, some errors unit for just them um, grouping these together because I'm going to validate one, one value. It's like, okay, does it start with I? Does it contain did? And does it end with period? And then, the variant type I use inside is like, if it's an error, I have an array of errors because that's just what I'm going to use in the runtime representation. And then if it works, then I have this success, which is like an echo of the string. And so I get this, uh, I run NV to run the validation or to extract the valid value out. And so in the errors case, I inject my variant in with this errors tag. In the success case, I inject my success case uh, type. And so since it's using this variant, you can then look at the generated output. And we'll see that, yeah, it has this errors tag, value string array, and then success value string. And if we look at the actual usage, then it looks like this. So you know, validate that end log is a function of just find a flow, takes a string in, runs the validate on it, like main.validate input, and it this has the type in it because of my generated types, but I just annotated just for show. But yeah, this is a part where like TypeScript and flow users use this uh, static discriminant type because it exists on all members of the union type. You can use this to type guard. So when you've matched the string literal case errors, then the compiler or type checker eliminates the other members or kind of just brings it down to the only the members that have the string literal errors as the type field or type property. And then you can do like return main.log and then stringify on result.value, which in this case is gonna be a array of strings. And in this case of success, then it's going to be a normal string. And the other things I just glanced over is like this add to function, it takes a number in, so it correctly checks that you get these numbers. And the same thing with the like log, it's a dump function, so it makes sure that you pass in a string and then uh, call it. But yeah, and we run this like validate and log thing and just runs through this code. And it's like, yeah, if you pass it like I did it correctly, then it gives you success. Otherwise, it gives you like the different error cases that Joe went over. But uh, this is about it. Um, if I go look at my uh, type generation code, and uh, it's not like the prettiest API, but basically it's just um, you know create a module definition. This is the module like uh, name I'm going to use. Uh, you you could like put like third party library style name, just like just a name or whatever. But in this case, I need it to be uh, relative path library typing. And then I do like de declare flow type. So I declare like what kind of type I'm gonna be uh, using and then like from foldable to pass in a string map of my functions and then the flow type representation that I'm gonna be using. And so this, ends up with my uh, generated types that are here. Yeah, so module output main, validation result, and then ex module exports, because it's a common JS module, it has these three things. But yeah, that's about it for my demo. Uh, do I have a TLDR in this one? No, I don't. But yeah, the TLDR, I guess, is just this file.
I got a quick question about why uh, you needed to use the variant. Uh, is that only because variant is a data type? But uh, like uh, data, if, like if you want, if you want, if you want to use some types or product types, you can't really like you, you yeah, can I mean, handle those, right? Yeah. The thing about bismuth is that like you don't want to do any kind of conversions between stuff. Right, like a some type or a product type would require like the class reference and like a whole bunch of stuff. And so I just treat product and some types as opaque. And so like you know, product types you never actually need them because you could always model product types as records. But then sometimes you can never actually re represent them in a way where you can have direct F five. Like you can't have JavaScript create a some type and send it to you because like that. Class uh, classes is that everything will be wrong. So in this case, uh, because variant uses this object encoding, uh, you can you can have the JS site correctly gives you correctly build up this record and send it to you, and also you can send the record to to the JS side and it knows how to uh, handle it. Uh, okay, so so this pure script variant that library, it's like runtime encoding. Is what you see there? It's an object with a type and value. Yes. Yeah, and then. Okay. Cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's this uh, cool library that Nate made a uh, while ago. But yeah, only a um, couple months ago, it, it's got updated to use uh, to use records. Um, I think the docs still say that it uses a tuple, which is out of date, or maybe this is just the introduction. But yeah, it used to use a tuple, and it was hard for me to work with. And but then uh, Nate changed it, so now it's like very readily usable for doing JS interop or flow types of interop. Don't let JSON fool you. It's all because variants can be worked with using row lists. <laughs> Basically, I mean we can look at the. Uh, implementation again where um, yeah I used to have my own implementation uh, of this record structure and I called it like fake sum record so yeah it's like you, uh, where's my class definition it's like here right so like uh, if it, give me a row list of like the variant members or like the possible variants and I'll give you a list of strings for like the type signatures that have been created. And then it's like, on the nil case, it's just an empty list. And in the cons case, it's like, okay, go through the rest of the list, make sure the name is a symbol so that we could reflect it. Make sure we have a flow type representation for this type that we're gonna work with. And then like cons name time tail. And it just cons these together where uh, basically the head is this type, uh, object of type, the string literal key value and value type. Hopefully this makes some amount of sense. I don't know. I wrote a blog post about it the other day. So hopefully that might be useful. I don't know. And yeah, it's called control flow with business. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? What was the inspiration for the name of this one, this library? Oh, um, so Steven came up with the name business because he thought it would be cool to have like an element name instead of some like lame Korean snack or whatever you call it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but then accidentally we found out that, uh, yeah, if you go down here, you find out it, that it's in Pepto Bismol <laughs> and it's an anti diarrheal business subsalicy. <laughs> so yeah, controlled flow, <laughs> controlled flow, in many ways than one. <laughs> so for the variant stuff, just just so that I'm solidifying my understanding of it, variant is basically a an open sum type where the fields are tagged with a string proxy, right? Uh, and not necessarily even open, right? Because this is a closed. Uh, oh, right, because you close the row. 
Yeah, but it's an actual union type. So um, personally, I don't use C, but I guess C has some concept of union types, right? Um, I think the big difference with C is that the union types are like, a, it shares the same memory representation no matter what type you pull out of the union. So you make a union that can be either a float or an int, then when you look at the union as if it were a float, so you put an int into the union, and then you look at it as if it were a float, and it'll be like, this is the floating point representation of the memory that you said was an integer before. Go nuts. Have a fun time. That sounds pretty dangerous. So well, thankfully, uh, this is pretty also safe. has untyped unions. Those are even more fun. <laughs> <laughs> My god. So there's more ways to shoot your because, own because, no, because I mean, because then there's no tag to tell you which representation you're looking at right now, and you need to get it from context. And if you choose the wrong one, then you're <laughs> doing well, all kinds yeah. of fun overflow stuff. One of the reasons why like, the scene thing is useful is you can like, read in, like say you're reading in data from like a serial buffer uh, into a union, and you could be like, read in all of this data, and it's coming in as like a UN8, and then you can be like, actually, I know that these, these bytes are coming in as like combinations of floats. So you can have it so that you're reading in a bunch of bytes, but then you can just use the union to view it as if they were floating point numbers. So it's useful, but there's a really easy way to shoot your face off. So with great power comes a lot of broken code. <laughs> Except for roll list, everything in roll list is safe. Is it all safe? Mm, barely. I don't know. Well, um, as soon as you get into duplicate label stuff for records, that's kind of tricky, I guess. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, that stuff, I guess it compiles. So it is pretty terrible. So we do need like an <laughs> extra type class to say no duplicates allowed. I mean, we, we did assign semantics to it. We said the first one is the one that appears in the record, and everything else is like, uh, like type level but not value level. Yeah, I might have broken the rule a couple times. <laughs> it might be like last uh, last out like is input, but yeah, at least like yeah. So the variant thing is like here I have the case where I have this closed variant union, like add fruit, remove fruit, right, and then like yeah, you can supply fruit and like it works with that. So variant like pretty much the only functions you actually need to work with variants are, well, like, of course, you, you should like define your rows this way, right? So this is a tag that you're going to work with, and this is the actual type of value that you're going to work with. And then you need to know match, so you use the same label, and you do whatever you want, or, or you supply a function that's going to be the handler. So in this case, it's like, you know, I take the state, and I take the action in, in this match, uh, it's the second argument for this match. And then inside it, both of these branches convert into state, and then that's the state that comes out. So like this, and then the function I showed before where you do, oops, not this one, not this one. Can I find it? Yeah. So that and uh, inject. These are like the three things you need to know to use this library, and then everything else just like falls together. So yeah. What uh, um, what happens with your bismuth and oh yes, if you feed it in like an open variant? Like, will it just still work fine, or does it need to be closed? No, it'll like crash. I. Think. Well, actually, I'm not entirely sure. Like, probably won't find an instance. Because yeah, it's gonna I mean, be like, I can't find an instance of row list for the type variable in there or something. Like, what does this do? What does variant do if you have a closed variant and then, like, you, like, yeah, pass in that in invalid thing? Like, it, it won't type check in flow unless you just, like, course any or something. Or Very the same. You can't inject. You can't inject if the row is closed. Like you can't inject from, wrong from labels. From pure script, you can't. From JavaScript, you can inject crap. 
So yeah, I mean, there's no validation there. Yeah. So, but I mean, I guess you could easily from a pure script variant type derive a validator that checks that the JavaScript has the correct type. Yeah. So you could definitely just parse the, uh, the parse the variants as foreign or from foreign. That's the next addition to simple JSON, by the way. In case you didn't know. Hmm? Is there? You need, to add, you need to add that to simple JSON. Just saying. To convert from variants or convert to and from variants. Yeah, to and from variants, exactly. Yeah, I guess that's something we need. Let's see. GitHub in action. Um, support variant. Enough said. So that's kind of like that's that's complex to figure out what you want to do there, though, right? Because there is like, there's a canonical record exact like implementation in JavaScript because there are records, but there's no canonical. This is how you represent some types, really, right? So you're just kind of like this is how we should do it, and then you're making an opinionated decision about what some types should look like as no, but this isn't a some type, right? Like there's like. I mean, I, I treat it as a black box, right? Because it's like what's in the runtime right now is like basic classes and whatever, but it could not be, or maybe it shouldn't be, I don't know. But at least the variant is like something that is purposely chosen by Nate on a, in his library, right? So if this ever breaks, then it's like a major version bump, things will break, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, at least like this record this record uh thing is something that's like user user land decided. So it's not dependent on the pure script version. Well, it's I mean, kind of like, dependent on it being JavaScript, but yeah. What would the like how would you read JSON of something that's gonna get read into a variant though? I guess is my question. Like what is it even like? Oh uh, I mean, you just unsafely, or you you know that it's going to be this shape like type and value, or you try to read that in first, right? And then you're going to have this horrible n times n thing where it's like you just have string type and then value whatever foreign, and then you're going to write some type class that just iterates through like the rows of your variants. Well, when you get the that way. you use the row list you get for the variant, right? And then you just match, try to match the label, yeah, against against the thing in the type field. Well, you should yeah. if it's if you're parsing from JSON though, you should probably also check the value, not just yeah, 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 absolutely. But I mean, like as soon as you check the label, then you know which JSON, uh, like what value, what type you need to sorry. Uh, like what, what the value is supposed to be, what type it needs to have. So you don't need to check whether it has any of the possible like values. As oh, yeah, if yeah. you check the label first, you know what value you need to validate. Definitely. So I mean, I was thinking that uh, I think you would read it into just any generic uh, JavaScript object with type string and then value form, and then you would start iterating through the row list or something. I don't know. Maybe yeah, I mean, smarter and, ways. And, and I'm, I'm, I can, uh, I, I agree that there is, there should not be like an opinionated decision about how to encode some types in simple JSON. But I think for variants, it's fine because yeah, variants is fine. I think for yeah. some types, I guess like maybe we should provide some kind of a utility about like. Working with the generic information, like generic strep information, but yeah, there's like it's it's a whole it's a whole mess of different opinions and like flame wars. Yeah, and I mean, simple JSON. The nice thing is that it does not require me to derive JSON, uh, derive generic, which I really like. Yeah, but for like, ADTs, you would have to. Yeah, exactly. Well, and then and yeah, you would never need to use products, but for some sake, yeah. But then again, like if you have variant, like you can always just write the code for converting a variant to a sum, or you can just work with the closed variant set. Like this isn't like so much worse than pattern match. Uh, like well, working with variant match isn't so much worse. <laughs> no. I we have a few very big variants. Um, 
there's definitely some convenience to be had in the compiler supplied sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, like variants still aren't first class and they probably won't be, so most people aren't going to be using them, I think. But I like them as like an intermediate step before validate, like a serialization, um, because that's where we use them a lot as well. Yeah. So could you use like gener the generics rep form of a subtype to basically create a variant before it gets serialized out to JSON? Like that's the thing that you could do with the information available. You can't mm. you can't generate the type from the generics rep, right? Because you kind of need to know the type and the variants in order to encode it. Mm, right. we, um, what do you mean? Like, I think you can build you can, a row list. But the stuff like, you can do is if you check out the, sorry, the codec argonaut library, right, from Gary, there is a couple of helpers there to work with variants. Um, and I added a couple of examples as to how we use them. Uh, in here? Yes. Yeah, so. I map to variant from variant, and then in case. Hmm. But I mean, that involves more boilerplate than I like, but at the same time, it's like benign boilerplate that you can't get it wrong. Yeah. Tangentially related, if at any point anyone would be willing or interested in doing a demo on Codec Argonaut, something that I've thought was very interesting for a while and just haven't built up the motivation to try and diving in and building these codecs for myself. Um, but it's something that sounds really like using profunctors for codecs is a really cool idea. I just haven't done enough to for it to be like second nature yet. The the important like requirement that you need to have for this to be nicer than just using Argonauts is that you need to be serializing and deserializing your data. And you need to sometimes need to migrate data from an old format into a new one. Because that's the side, the thing that gets really nice, like is really nice with this. So if you're just calling APIs with it, it's a bit nah. But if you're storing that data somewhere and then reading it back in, that's where it's like super useful. Sorry, when you were saying you needed conversion from old format into a new format, what a what what do you mean by that? Like For example, you renamed some field in some of your data type and then like in version 4.2 of your software, that field was called uh, foo, and now you need to call that field bar, and then, but now you don't know if people, like, and now, now you release a version of your software 4.3, but people still need to be able to work with the data they generated with 4.2. So there might be foos in there, and then what you want your application to do is to automatically convert that into the like data with now is the bar field instead. Huh, that's really right. cool. Um, other than that, it's like basically manually passing the instances around for Argonaut because yeah, it's not instance based, so you can have because you don't want a canonical instance for some data type because again, you might have like multiple representations that are still in use because people use different versions of your software and now you all need to migrate them, migrate them over. So. I can definitely come up with a couple of examples, I think. I was gonna write the variant errors blog post first though because I think that's gonna be super cool. Like, I think that's super cool and the blog post is gonna be interesting to some people, I think. Yeah, that would be awesome, especially given that well, especially when all this error validation stuff has been popular recently in the FP chat Slack too. Showing how variants are useful for errors would be neat. Um, yeah, it's not going to be about validation. Uh, it's more about being able to not have the giant sum type which contains all the possible errors, because that creates this like weird dependency graph where you have like one module which contains all the errors for the application and this huge pattern match. And now everything needs to import that module in order to create these errors. But what you'd rather have is like every subpart of the application defines the errors it can throw and how to handle them, and then you combine that at like somewhere higher up the hierarchy. And 
like one consequence of this is like when you do it with the huge sum type is that whenever you touch that module, you basically end up recompiling the entire application, which is kind of annoying to deal with. And it's very anti-module ad style and very allows you to because because like the label is just a string. It's a string at compile time, so you can't get it wrong, but uh, it doesn't create that dependency. Yeah, I think the thing that, that I guess would be useful, and I think this is maybe the motivating factor for me to just read in a variant more and figure it out a little better, is that style sounds really, really, really awesome for how you would want to build up complex validation logic. Because you could have small modules of a, a complex piece of validation that does the actual validating function and defines all your data structures and defines the fragment of your, your total error some type. In this case, your total error variant. And so you could just pull different things in as you want to do more complex validation like that. Um, and I mean, if you're like a company and you've got complex validating things, like that's your library. You just make a validation library and you can just add and remove and pull in little bits and pieces really easily for all of your different validation formats. Yeah, exactly. You, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You can stitch them together like, right, like your module provides the thing that validates and the pretty printer for the error that it might generate. And then somewhere up the higher level, you, you can stitch these together to create all these like, different kinds of validations. There's just a really nice modular way of working with some things. It's not as nice if you need to do e instance for these variants, because then you end up writing a lot of boilerplate, for example. Yeah, I think this is about it. I don't know. Uh, yes, but it's getting a bit late. I wanna, I'm going to leave as well. Yeah, I think this is about all I have anyways. Yeah. Do we, do we uh, know uh, when the 0 0.12 is going to be released? Is that pretty close? Or do you think it, it might be? There's no timeline on it when it's ready, basically. Yeah. Um, okay. There's still some bugs in there which are not fixed. and. I'm gonna need someone to take take over the work on fixing them. Okay, yeah. So then I guess we could uh, close up then. Um, yeah, uh, I think we'll have some uh, topics to discuss uh, next month's meetup too. Um, yeah, let's see. I just wanted to close out with a few uh, notes about upcoming events. Uh, there's PeerScript Conf coming up in. June of 2018. Uh, so if you have any topics that you want to introduce for that, uh, then there's directions and a, a thing here. Um, looks like there's going to be an entrance fee this year, which is pretty interesting, first time. Um, so I'm kind of excited to see what that turns out to be like. It gives you t-shirts and food, so that sounds nice. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it looks like there's also some new local PeerScripts meetups happening. Um, so meetup.com is where uh, I, I usually look for local meetups. And it looks like PeerScript has uh, some new ones. Uh, what were they? New York has one now in the last month or two. Los Angeles, I think Helsinki. It looks like Paris also. Uh, yeah, so if you live in, uh, in any of these areas, you should be sure to check and see if you can join up with your local prescriptors. And also, um, maybe people haven't seen it yet, but uh, like Zurihack registration is open. So if you live in Europe and you are willing to go to Zurich for a free hackathon, uh, it's like Haskell focused, I guess, but it's also just like you can do whatever you want. Like last year, I worked on some pursuit and Pierce compiler stuff. So please, like, sign up and go. It's fun and it's like by a lake in Switzerland. So you get to look at the Alps and drink beer outside. If that sounds fun. Beginning of June sounds like it might overlap. Yeah, it might overlap. So it's like if anyone is not going to the US, then they might come to this one. Like, I don't know, even as an American, I'll be in Europe. So 
Yeah. Oh, uh, what? Uh, Lambda Comp is ends on the fifth, June fifth. Uh -huh. Then no, the mini calls are in the sixth, right? So the peer Comp is that. It starts on the right. Uh, yeah, the sixth. Excuse me. It ends on the sixth. Yeah, so you need to get on a flight on the 7th and fly um, about 10 hours into the future. So you'll get here with some big, uh, some big leg. But yeah, I don't know. If you really want to like Iron Man it and come to both, then please do. <laughs> so this, this hackathon is three days. Uh, is there sleeping involved? <laughs> a what? Is there, is there sleeping? Will people, will people be able to sleep in this three-day hackathon? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just a, a, a casual hackathon. So there's some keynote speakers. The talks are mostly like spread out every couple of hours. And then you work on any project you want or just like talk to people and talk about Haskell or PureScript or anything. Like okay. last year, I mostly trolled everyone talking about how they should have better ID tools than Haskell. And they should have real types in Haskell. And I mean, if we go like if you go this year, you might get lucky again and have Ed Komet show up and do a keynote where he says he's going to talk about Haskell and then he talks about C plus plus the entire time. <laughs> he also talked about some uh, origin stories about how Lens was motivated by him wanting to make a Mario playing bot and some Quake three aim bots, like to calculate rocket and grenade trajectory and whatever. So there's some cool stuff to be had when you come to Zuri Hack. Yeah, it's in Rappersville. So your hotel in Zurich probably, and then take a train for like 30 minutes. Like it's not very far. And yeah. Um, I just also wanted to say on the note of like the talking about the meetups and stuff, uh, whenever the video comes out, the video that the foam guys did on their PureScript Web3 library is excellent. I don't care very much about like all the blockchain stuff that's super popular now, and it was still very interesting to learn about all of these things that they're talking about and what they built with it. Um, and it's all in PureScript, which is kind of neat. Yeah, they were... Mm. <laughs> Sure. It might be just under Pure Script Web Three or NY Pure Script. I don't remember how quickly they said they were going to get the video up, but also Opera, Justin. This is me. Oh, Opera, okay. Opera, never mind. Opera, Damn it. It's all Firefox. I'm still not quite sure about Firefox. I like the new one, and not just because it has Rust in it, but also a lot because it has Rust in it. It has Rust in it. But how do I get Google to spy on me if I use Firefox? Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't think it went out yet. So whenever it goes up. Okay. Yeah, if you can get if you get a chance, you should definitely watch the F talk from from Mate. Oh my God! Yes, That's that excellent. happened as well. So good. Um, so, yeah, if anyone also here hasn't gotten a chance to play around with F yet, just in general, on that topic, um, I'm not even joking when I say that half of the reason I wanted to do all of that crazy pure script, like on Lambda and Alexa and stuff like that, was because I really desperately wanted F over every other way of doing asynchronicity and concurrency in JavaScript. F really is that nice. It's worth bending over backwards and doing weird FFI just to get all of your JavaScript libraries to work with it. It's kind of amazing. So watch that talk. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that, the PureScript community, that's in one of those playlists. So if you can't find it, you can look around in there. Um, yeah, otherwise, I think we should wrap up for today. Yep. Thanks a lot, for everyone, for joining. This is, was super great to have see so many projects. Um, oh, so no, until great. next time. Uh, Oh. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. <sighs>